Hello and welcome to a Burkamp Wonderland podcast. Uh, it's the interlow. Um, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a dull one. Um, not a lot to talk about other than the Brighton game, which is not a lot to talk about either. But we'll find something to discuss. Hopefully, to make it a bit easier for me, I have two guests with me tonight. Uh, introduce you first. Of Twitch fame, Nick Fights. It's Nick. Hello, Nick. Hello, John. No, hang on. That's Danny's thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Doing, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I'm a bit bored, but, you know, this is what happens whenever the interlows on. Yeah, we always get bored when there's no, no football on and watching England makes it so much worse. Oh, I'm not even bothering watching that. I can't be doing with that stuff. Um, I, that's the weird thing. The interlove starts and then I don't actually watch any of the international games and I forget that te- uh, teams are actually playing. I just assume football doesn't exist anymore uh, like for these two weeks or however long it is. Uh, I, just, also- I just play the game just um, waiting to see how many Liverpool and United players are going to miraculously you know, leave international duty through injury and then play the first game back when we start again. That is a good one, actually. That's, yeah. Or see, actually, see if your most hated player gets injured. There you go. Look, look out for that in the international games if you are watching. You might have some fun. Um, oh, Neil Mopay's not good enough to play international football, is he? It's a shame. I really <laughs> don't like him. Uh, also joined by, of Twitter fame, Cactus Cash, better known as Rich. How you doing, mate? How's it going, my man? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. How's yourself? I'm good. Um, I'm, I'm off work at the moment, so it's very confusing because I'm not used to this much time off. And I don't know what to do with myself. Um, you're not supposed to be bored when you're on holiday, are you? But uh, That's technically do. not the way it goes, but yeah, you know, you've, see you've put a new spin on things. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I always do things in my own way. It's very confusing, though. I don't know what to do with myself. Um, right, we'll talk about the last game, which is not very exciting, unfortunately, because it was Brighton nil, Arsenal nil. Um, only real change in the lineup was obviously Jacker picked up his injury, so Lokonga came in, which I think everyone kind of expected. Um, there was a possibility of maybe Pepe comes in and Odegaard or Smith Rowe moved back a bit deeper, but I think Arteta went with the right decision in the end, although we didn't get the result. Um, Rich, what did you make of the lineup itself and just the game in general? Uh, yeah, the lineup was was fairly. Uh, it was fairly succinct, really. It was it was what you kind of expected. Lukonga coming in after impressing in the the cameos and and brief bits and pieces um, they had. I was you know confidence was high, you know, due to the the absolute shellacking of uh, of the uh, the middle six people up the road. Um, but oh my god, what a turgid game! Uh, it, you know, obviously massively didn't help with the uh, with the weather. Absolutely. Uh, bucking it down um but yeah but you know after after a bright start we kind of reverted back to uh our usual off the ball passive type kind of thing um and and, and allowed brighton who are you know let's not think a very a decent football inside you know i think at one point was it last week or so the week before they could have gone top yeah, I think um, it was the, they, they, yeah, the game before. Yeah, they could have, if they'd yeah. won, they'd go top. Yeah. So they're, they're banging like the form of their lives. You know, they're, they're, they're no, they're no mugs kind of thing. And I think we, we kind of, I think we got a little bit scared and kind of just backed off a little bit too much and gave them far too much respect. And then it was just impossible to kind of try to, 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 to build and gain, gain any momentum. You know, their, their tactics of, of pressing us high and fast um and you know especially like when we had the, the ball at the back you know they were happy for us to to have goal kicks and pick up second balls which they did really really well um so it was it was always always going to be like a, a a tough game but like i said the, the weather didn't help but i was slightly disappointed but what can you say like you know you don't play well but you gain a point isn't, isn't that what they call like the stuff of champions or something like that i don't know maybe yeah yeah, I mean, I, I, would, yeah, I wouldn't quite say we're champions or anything like that. But no, that is right. I think this is one of those sort of games that, and I mean, I've, I've said this probably for years, the last few years under Wenger and then under Emery and Arteta as well, where you have these sort of games that you always remember in the past were the ones we lose. And now we're getting a point out of them. And that's obviously happened with three different managers. It's just we haven't taken the next step of going, oh, this is a really bad game, but we managed to nick a win. Mm. Sort of thing, um, like we see Man United do a lot this season. Um, yeah, it, Nick, in terms of the game itself, there wasn't a lot for us to 
sort of be excited about. I guess other than that, I thought the defence looked pretty solid again for the most part. Tommy Yessi probably had his worst game for us. He was up against a very, very good wingback who I'd not seen before, Cucurella, I think he was at Barca previously. Um, and Ramsdale, again, showing that actually looks like it was a pretty savvy purchase getting him in. Yeah, I mean, I remember talking about Ramsdale in the pre-season, and I think most of us were saying we don't want to buy him, mainly because we didn't want to spend that much money on a backup goalkeeper. And then when I think, but I think um, didn't um, Sheffield United actually pay about twenty million for him anyway? They did pay, yeah, I think they pay quite a high fee. For yeah, him. so obviously yeah. they, you know, they couldn't afford to take a hit on him. You know, they could gamble and maybe come back up and then get that money again. But the fact that we've, we're playing him as first choice, you know, I'm completely, completely fine with that now. You know, so I'm quite happy with that. And I'm actually happy and surprised Arteta's stuck with the same back four and the goalkeeper for about four or five games in a row because most of his Arsenal managing career, we seem to get a run of, you know, a team going. And then for some reason or another, he just breaks up the defence or changes everything up. I mean, I remember the start of last season, wouldn't we have um, Holden and Gabriel for about what, two and a bit months? And then all of a yeah. sudden changed it, changed it again. And then David Louise turned up again and we thought, oh, he, you know, we couldn't stop changing it. And he was getting I, I think I think it helps that we haven't got Europe or any, you know, any midweek games. I think that helps a lot being able to be consistent. Yeah, that's probably true. I mean, because, yeah, if they were playing well in the European games, then how could he say, all right, you just lost the week, you know, the game against, you know, whoever the weekend, but these guys are keeping a clean sheet in Europe. I suppose that could be a point to it, but I just yeah, my mouth the, the, the fitness aspect is definitely one thing. It's a lot easier to keep a consistent back four then. The, the thing I would say is that, when Arteta first came in, the first thing he fixed was the defence, really. Um, it wasn't perfect, but he changed that back three system and he made sure that we were defending well first. And then into his you know, first proper season, but was, was during COVID when there was no fans in the stadium, he tried to get to the back four and it just wasn't working at times. And defensively, we looked awful. Um, now he's got all his players in, all the ones he wanted. Um, and this seems to be his first choice back line at the moment. Um, and I think so far he's been proved right. Um, as I said, Tommy Yassi didn't have his best game. I think if you actually look at his stats, he didn't lose as many duels as everyone maybe made out. But it's that thing of your eyes will see one thing, but the stats will tell you another. Because before this game, every game he'd played, he looked amazing and looked like no one could beat him. And I don't think he'd actually been beaten in a one in a one on one at any point. But, you know, Brighton was smart in the way they tried to isolate him and Ben White. They didn't let Ramsdale play out from the back to Ben White, which I think was like previous to this game was the uh, most consistent pass Ramsdale had done. They were quite happy to let Gabriel have the ball, but they didn't want Ben White to have it, which obviously makes sense. He's more of the ball playing centre back and Brighton obviously know a lot about him. Um, Rich, in, in terms of the game, I think you're obviously what you said is right. Brighton have had a great start to the season. Um and almost in a way, I can see how they kind of, if you look at what, if Arteta stays in the job, what Arteta's team might be like in two years' time, maybe, um, in the sense that Potter's come in, he's got this group of players together, they've been together a long time now, and he's implementing the game plan and they're taking it on really well. Arteta's obviously trying to do the same thing, but it's starting as if almost brand new. Um, the, the difference is when you've got two very young teams, you need your senior pros to perform. And Brighton seemed to have that. And I think in our team, if you look at it, we had, what, Thomas Party, Aubameyang. Other than that, the real senior players in the team, I mean, Gabriel, I guess, who, for me, did his job on the day. But in terms of the midfield... Still only 23, forwards, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, but that's the thing. We're looking at him, maybe Tierney is like sort of the senior players in the back line, um, sort of the leaders. But Party and Aubameyang really weren't at it on the day, were they? No, no. I, I, again, I, th I thought I, I wasn't massively impressed with Lukonga, too, too tough as well. Um, and that's not me like digging him out or saying he's rubbish or blah 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 blah. Um, I thought he was he was a little slow uh, on the ball and 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 uh, a, a little bit 
again, going back to my favourite word um, that I use uh, for this Arsenal team, the passive. He was a bit too passive for my liking. Uh, and just, you know, absolutely nothing was sticking with Aubameyang. Um, I think, you know, obviously the, the big difference is in the North London derby, you know, you've got the home fans, glorious sunshine, everybody's super pumped, pumped, sorry. Uh, you know, and he's going up against Eric Dyer and I can't remember whatever. Was it Sanchez, Davison Sanchez? Whereas, mm. you know, in this game, it's in the absolute sheet in rain. And he's up against three centre halves, I think the smallest of which is like six foot three. Um, and, you know, I said where, where they, how they were smart and they pressed us, you know, we, we with that link, they just, they cut that link from, from Ben White to Partey and, and going through our, that, that change, you know, the amount of times that Ramsdale had, had to go long uh, and the ball's just sailing over like Erdegaard's head. I think like he had like so few passes. I can't remember the, the actual stat, but um, yeah, it just, it was, it was a bad day at the office all round. And I think you, you want your, so one of the things that I would want, and I want Arteta to do this as well, to to, to in in some respect, but you you need your leaders to do it as well. Is they've got the boots on the ground, they're on the pitch, they can see what's working and what's going on, and and so you would want to them to be able to recognise the game state, to recognise the situations that's going on that pitch, and then make their slight slight adjustments, kind of thing, you know. Um, just just to switch some some things around i think it took us too far too long especially like the entirety of that first half to kind of do any sort of adjustments um and like i said the the biggest thing for me that that really really wound me up was just the the, the amount of time that we allowed um brighton on the ball i think was was just the biggest detriment and you know as soon as we got the ball they pressed us and you know, on a on a crappy pitch with some of our players not, you know, up to having their best game, we couldn't keep the ball. I think I don't know if you if the stats are again the thing, but I think like our possession stats were like ridiculously low. Like yeah, they like, were they were pretty low. I think it was like uh, we were under forty or something like that. I think for yeah, yeah. So it's it it was just and, and you know that's one of the things I will say. How long has Potter been in in charge of Brighton? Has it been the same amount of time as as Arteta um, or? I'm not sure. I'm going to look now. I'm going to pretend I'm a professional and I'm not typing. Yeah, yeah. Because that is, you know, the the, the way that Potter uh, Potter's team, that's how I want Arsenal to play. You know, aggressive off the ball, move, you know, movement off, uh, um, off the ball. And I, you know, I, I'm you know, part of our, our group and stuff like that and, and uh, massive online. I think I'm quite an Arteta apologist kind of thing. But, you know, I, I would have liked to think that he'd got his act to get a bit better um, together already kind of thing. As when you compare to, like I say, to, to Brighton, who have a much smaller budget than us. And I'm, I'm fairly certain he's been in the same amount of time. Because wasn't, wasn't Potter, um, he was at Ostend's, wasn't he? When Emery's yes. Arsenal... They beat us at home and we beat yeah. them away, or so, uh, uh, yeah. vice versa. Sorry. So both both came in in 2019, um, and he joined. So he joined 2019 season start, and Arteta obviously came in on when was it? it was December, wasn't it? Uh, mm. Yeah. So December time. So yeah, Potter had a pre-season uh, with okay. Brighton, um, proper full season and pre-season and stuff. Uh, but yeah, he's obviously he's got a longer career. He was at mm. Oster, Ostend for seven years. Jeez, I didn't mm. realize it was that long. Yeah. So I mean, but you know, but to try and not be completely negative, Nancy, I think mm. is is that is that ten points from twelve that we yeah, we've got. That's ten so points from twelve. That's yeah. not that's not terrible, and especially considering the you know absolute abysmal uh, start we had. Yeah. You know, seemingly we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, um, I think uh, Gunnerblog was talking about and said if you put the Brighton game at the start of this run and you went Brighton, Norwich, uh, Burnley, Tottenham, then you'd be going into the interlull with the same number of points, but you'd be going, oh, that was really good. It's just mm. obviously the, the nil-nils come sort of at the end of it. Um, mm. Nick, obviously we were talking about senior players performing. Um, is this something you kind of expect that you're going to get games like this 
during the season because everyone's had to readjust their opinion of Arsenal and where they're going to finish. But we have got a very young team. You know, when we're talking about the likes of Gabriel, Tierney, uh, Erdegaard's even spoken about as a leader, these are all guys who are 22, 23. The majority of the team is that age or younger. Um, it's only really Partey and Aubameyang from the starting eleven, um, which looks to be the settled starting eleven. Obviously, Jacko is available, um, that he's over that age. So it's just just sort of the thing that will happen with young players and young teams that we've seen from other sides down the years. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, thinking how the season's going to go and how you know Arteta's trust the process and all that sort of thing. And yeah, I mean, he's got. I think, I'm pretty sure we've got the youngest squad in the Premiership, which is not normally something we have. But I just think, yeah, we're going to have a lot of games like we've had since the season started. Games where we're terrible, t- games where we're really good, games where nothing happened. But I just think if this goes how Arteta and Edu and Arsenal want it to go, but towards the tail end of the season, like the last 10, 15 games... For this to be working, we've got to hit some some kind of consistency and really make a good push for Europe, if not top four, because that, that that's what they're doing. It'd be nice if we could just go out like City and Chelsea and spend a hundred million pound on this player, a hundred million pound on that player, find out their crap and just loan them out and pay their wages till their contract is up. But we can't, so we're doing a a different way, and this is kind of similar to how Klopp and Liverpool did it and they had about yeah what, in a bit years before they yeah. were, and he was buying weird players from Southampton that people thought well Mane ain't no good and turns out yeah. he wasn't the fashionable you know 60 70 million pound player from abroad he was from Southampton you know so I'm I'm actually a little bit optimistic because that's why like there's not many people having meltdowns because we can see what Arsenal are trying to do. We have spent money in the summer. I think we spent more money, at least on transfers. I don't know about wages and stuff like that, but at least on transfer fees, we spent more money than anyone in Europe, which is a complete contrast to, what was it, 2015, where we were the only team in Europe to not buy an outfield player, when we only yeah, we got a check. Yeah, we got a check, didn't we, and no one else, yeah. Yeah, oh, so... Yeah. What a window. Um, yeah. We can't really complain. I mean, he's been backed probably more than any Arsenal manager for the last, what, five or six years, probably since peak Wenger, really. Yeah. I think towards the end of the Wenger, I don't think he was getting everything his own way with, obviously, with Wenger and Gazidis. You always heard stuff with about them behind the scenes. They didn't get on and stuff like that. But, yeah, it, it's going to be an up-and-down season until, you know, these players get to know each other, you know. and we can see how good they can be. And if, if he's going to start from the defence, that's perfect. Because for years, everyone has said, oh, Arsenal are a brilliant team going forward. Shame they're crap at the back. Yeah. So if he can fix that, which is going to be difficult to fix that without affecting the strikers, which obviously is what he's done. But he'll have to try and get the balance right towards the end of the season. Yeah, um, and just sort of sticking, it's kind of sticking with the game, but um, going on to a player in particular, uh, Rich, obviously Arteta made some subs, um, Erdegaard came off, um, he wasn't particularly effective in the game, I thought it's probably his worst game in an Arsenal shirt, to be fair. Mm. Not all his fault, because the midfield really didn't control it, and again, um, take nothing away from Brighton, because I thought they played really well when we were lucky to get a point, to be fair. If, if they could finish, then, you know, we, we probably mm. could have lost that 2 3 nil. Um, Pepe came on. Um, Lacazette and Maitland Niles also made an appearance. Um, Arteta not scared to make big decisions by taking off a Bamiang. Um, it clearly weren't working for him. Had no issue with Lacazette. I don't think he was amazing. Um, Pepe is someone who's always divided opinion, I think, since he's been at the club. Some people love him, some people hate him, some are almost indifferent towards him if he has a good game that is great but then if he has a you know terrible game everyone goes well that's just Pepe you, you never know what you're going to get I'm not saying on this game in particular it's not on him to come on and change the game but when you've got Erdegaard, Smith Rowe and Saka who are all exceptional talents we all love them think they're great and they're going to have amazing careers hopefully for a very long time at Arsenal or not somewhere else 
Um, but they're going to have games where they're going to struggle a little bit, just because they're young and form and consistency isn't there when you're that sort of age. Pepe is 27, I think I'm right in saying. I'll uh, see, this is one of those things I should have looked up again. Danny is so much better at this than me. 26. Um, he shouldn't necessarily have come on and changed this game. Um, but in general, his Arsenal career, I think it is getting to the point where even the people who do like him and do back him are starting to question whether he should still be at the club just because that consistency isn't there. What, what, what do you make of his Arsenal career? Because last season, he was our top contributor for goals and assists. So it's not like he didn't do it anything last season. But still, there's doubts over him. Uh, yeah, well, it kind of it, it goes back a little bit to what you said earlier that you know that that stats v eyes thing. You know, the stats say that he's our top goal contributor, but your eyes have have seen him be completely ineffectual, and especially you know against a, a um, in in the final third when the team's sitting deep and stuff like that. The the he. he doesn't really. I don't know. I don't know if it's just me, but I just I, sometimes I, I I think he struggles to take on people in that final third. You know, if it's around about the midfield area and uh, and and we're breaking from our own half, like he's really good. He can be able to ability to run into space. It's just as soon as as soon as he gets into that final third, and they have the ability to they you know they've got the the pitch behind them to act as a, or the, you know, the, the sidelines to act as an extra defender kind of thing. He kind of struggles. Um, and especially when, when teams double team him, which the, you know, they, they, they do often kind of thing. Um, I, I neither like or, or hate Pepe. Um, I, I feel kind of sorry for him in the sense of, you know, he, he's come in to decide astronomical money spent on him way too much money that, that that we spent on him and that price tag kind of always gets mentioned with him uh with, you know which is a tad bit unfair and also you know we, we're asking for consistency from him but we've never given him consistency of selection and consistency of, of even a manager at times kind of thing do you know what i mean um it also doesn't help his cause the emergence of Saka and Smith Rowe, um, which is another thing that's kind of you know uh, gone against him uh, slightly a little bit. Um, you know, as I said before, like I I would have picked that that team uh, on against Brighton, but as the game wore on, you could see that this was probably a game for Pepe. Um, you know, he was uh, somewhere that he could, you know, Brighton's got loads of uh, uh, loads of um, space in the backfield. And, you know, he can get off and, and, and break and be played in behind and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's just it's 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 hard for him because like I said like the, the stats wise is it's decent. But your eyes tell you that there's not there's something just not right and there's something just not clicking. I don't know if it's just if it's the league or the type of football that that we're playing with him just not suited to him, but it's just it's not clicking. And I would imagine how long and how long has he got left on his contract? I, I would imagine like uh, he... probably two and a half years, maybe something like that. Mm. I, I'd imagine he would have signed on a five year deal, um, mm. something like that. So he's been there a while now, hasn't he? Um, yeah, I, I can. I I wouldn't be surprised if he was if he was sold next summer. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, um, I'm just. Gonna How much do you think now. we'd get for him? I mean, you're, you're not. Million, like that. You're you're not getting the same money back. Uh, is the problem? Um, I don't even think you'd get half. I, it honestly depends on. So on transfer market, he's valued at thirty one and a half. Yeah. Um, let's see where is his contract so his contract expires oh 2024 okay yeah so yeah two two and a bit years um so this summer is where we 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 supposedly need to make our decision on what we're going to do with him yeah realistically there is that the the thing Nick, coming to what you said earlier about obviously not having Europe means that Arteta can have 
a consistent back four and goalkeeper and keep the team pretty steady, it's very good for the team. But for players like Pepe, who obviously, like Rich said, I think if it weren't for Smith Rowe and Saka and the way they're performing, would probably be in the team. And players like Martinelli, they're not going to get much game time. Um, Martinelli is less of an issue because of his age and he's, he's got a long time ahead of him. Whereas Pepe, because he is 26, um, you know, and we paid a lot of money for him, he's going to be expected when he does come in to perform straight away. I don't think anyone's expecting Martinelli drop you straight in the team. You should be having a banger every week, are they? I, I, sorry, I, to just interrupt. Yeah. I, I think Martinelli it is a problem as, as well with this, with no Europe, because he's, he's not even playing for like the under 23s or anything like that. He's getting very, very little game time in mm. a stage in his career where he needs to, to play. I think he's, he's another one who's, who's, I, I, I slightly disagree. I know what you're saying, kind of thing, mm. in, in the sense of uh, he's still young enough, kind of thing. But I, yeah. I, he needs minutes, man. He needs game time. Yeah. Do you, think, so- do you two think we're struggling because last year, obviously, with, during the COVID and before that, we had the five subs, so we were seeing a lot more players get a lot more game time coming on. I do think that was a factor. And also the games were so much more condensed. I think you'll see the team get rotated a lot more when you get to Christmas, when we are playing two games a week and the cup competitions come back and that sort of thing, uh, the cups that we're in anyway. Um, But at the moment, it is just that we're on the one game a week thing, which is going to be an issue. Um, I understand what you're saying about Martinelli, and I do agree to an extent, but I think there is also... Unfortunately, the onus is on the players who aren't in the team right now that you have to do better in training than Smith Rowe and Saka. I, I, I think we've seen from Arteta, barring probably Bakaya Saka, um, he's quite willing to drop most people um, if they're not doing well enough. Um, you know, there's there's an argument if Erdegaard puts in another performance like he did against Brighton, then maybe he gets dropped out of the team for a bit and Saka comes inside and Pepe gets back in the team again, you know. Or, or Martinelli or whoever. Um, we've got the same sort of issue with Balogun at the moment, who's, you know, ripped it up for the under-23, scored a ridiculous goal, uh, or won a ridiculous penalty the other night, if anyone hasn't seen it. Go oh, that, that, was, that, was, that was cool. That was <laughs> yeah. a blind bit of skill. I mean, that was like watching FIFA Street or something, but it just shows mm. you that he's, he's miles above that, but he's clearly not, at, you know, Premier League level yet. But you had the issue that... Uh, and Ketia didn't go, so then uh, Balogun probably would have got a loan if uh, would be would have the plan was Balogun stays and then Ketia goes, so he gets bumped up the, the pecking order, but then that didn't happen. And then Ketia is a better player currently than Balogun, um, at least from pre season he looked it. Um, so it causes more issues. Um, I do have a bit of sympathy for Arteta because if you loaned out players like Martinelli or Balogun, you get one or two injuries. Mm. And then you are left with absolutely nothing. Um, especially we've we've got the African Cup of Nations, so you lose what Abamian goes, uh, Parte goes, um, Pepe goes, uh, uh, El Nenny as El well. Nenny goes, yeah. yeah, you know, so you are going to lose a lot of players to so that period of the season. Um, come January time, whether they have to dip into the transfer market again, or those other players now get thrown into the team and have to sort of hold the fort for a month, six weeks, um, that's going to be the real test for them. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that sort of covers the Brighton game. Uh, the only thing I would say about it is anyone who is overly negative, I'd just say just watch Brighton's performances for the rest of the season and see how many points they pick up at home. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they got what some people consider an upset against a big team like a Man City or something like that at home and managed to get a draw. Um, maybe not play quite as dominantly, but um, I think they're going to do a lot better than maybe people expect. If they start they, I mean, this, they, this was on they, the cards last season for them as yeah, well, because they, they just were very, very good. They just couldn't finish. Yeah, couldn't finish, yeah. And to be fair, we saw that in the game against us, you know, and they mm. were missing Basuma. Um, who else was that injured? They had well, well back. back. Yeah, so they had a few, you know, a few good players out, uh, like key players in their team. And they, you know, Cucurella's just come in and he looks absolutely blinding player. I'm sure he's going to give people a nightmare all season playing down that side. Um, I know not everyone likes Lalana, but they've managed to keep him fit. And when he is fit and available, he's a very good player. I don't mm. like, I hate Mope. He's just got a face you want to punch. A mother wouldn't even <laughs> love that face, but he is good. He's annoying. 
Um, Veltman, who is a guy I'm sure we've been linked with like God knows how many times in the past, um, who's come in, he's done really well. And they've got that solid defence uh, that have worked. A lot of them have come up with Brighton through God knows how many leagues and they, they know how to do it and, and get things done. So, yeah, um, disappointing performance. But if you asked me before the game, I probably would have said, yeah, I'll take a point and be quite happy with it. But yeah, that sort of covers the Brighton game. Um, quick palate cleanser, because that was kind of a miserable performance if you had to watch it. Uh, Nick, what do you do to keep yourself entertained in the interlow? I I stream on Twitch under the name Nick Fights, you know, shameless oh, plug. There, there we go. Good, good plug, good plug. I like but it. Yeah, I, I, I don't watch any international football. I mean, I assume England are playing some games. I have no idea who they are playing, whether they're friendlies, qualifiers for the World Cup. Are we actually qualified for the World Cup yet? I, I don't know. I assume we will play Andorra or something like that, but <laughs> like we always seem to do. Yeah, I just like I said before the show, I just pretend football doesn't exist until it comes until the until like a few days before it comes back. And then to be honest, I can't even remember I don't even know who Arsenal got next, to be honest. That's how much of a good supporter I am. <laughs> we are Is it Palace? Yeah, we're home to Palace. Oh yeah, pa- right? Palace Villa yeah. is it the Monday the Friday or something, or Friday mm. Monday or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, um, I just it pretend football doesn't exist for two weeks. It's probably for the yeah. best, especially being an Arsenal supporter. <laughs> much the same, mate. Much the same. Um, I don't actually know who's playing at the moment in the internationals. I assume it's World Cup qualifiers. I don't know if it's World Cup or Euros. I've got no idea. I'm, I'm exactly the same. I pay no attention. Uh, I try and keep myself entertained with other things. Uh, normally I'm working, so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, Rich, what, what do you do to keep yourself entertained? Uh, at the minute, just, just uh, continue with uh, my uh, my training of the uh, the the under thirteen girls team I manage. Um, yeah, trying trying to cobble together enough players to uh, to to play a match this Saturday. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's it's school viewing uh, time, so oh, like, okay. there's a quite I got quite a few girls doing school viewings. So uh, yeah, we're trying to rearrange a different time to play a fixture. But yeah, no, I'm I'm not as down on on, on into football, uh, international football as as, as as others. I'm, you know, I, I'm a sucker for a a summer tournament and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm not as uh, 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 as tuned into it. I think yeah, I think we're playing Andorra. I don't know who else we're playing. Um, kind of thing. But yeah, no, just you know, play a bit of computer. And uh, and mainly just uh, you know do the um, do do the football and then on Sundays I play um, I, I I play football at Power League you know running around with my forty year old self <laughs> co- coughing and spluttering trying to chase after whippersnappers nice you know I think well, really playing Andorra because that was a complete guess no uh, no apparently I just looked this up we're playing I say we I don't. Cheer on England! I was cheering on England. It is we. Um, Come on, John! Don't don't no. lie. Don't I cheer on it. <laughs> I watch the summer tournaments. I do enjoy watching them, and I cheer on Italy the whole way through because they've got the best national anthem. Um, so I laughed my. I mean, I was sad, obviously, that Saka with the penalty. That was heartbreaking. It, that oh, was horrible. Right. Yeah, but I was I, also, as soon as he walked up, I went no because I knew. I was also jumping around cheering because Italy won and was screaming out my window of my flat, and everyone around me now hates me who lives next to me, which is great. Um, except for the Polish people upstairs, they thought it was very. I funny. normally hear different noises coming out of your bedroom window, anyway, <laughs> you, John. Uh, no comment. Um, yeah, apparently, if you're interested, listeners, England are playing Wales uh, on Thursday. They're friendly, and then Please. it's the UEFA Nations League which is that other competition thing that yeah. I'm very confused about, playing Belgium and then Denmark. Um, Speaking of staying on the on the old uh, international thing, what do you guys yeah. make of um, of uh, old Lord Wenger and his uh, his World Cup every two years uh, thing? Uh, um, <laughs> that is not a good reaction. <laughs> that is a, uh, I think, arson has been drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit too much. Uh, they've got no problem selling it. I, I don't be wrong. If it was on, I'd watch it. But if you did that, then you've got to have a Euros every two years. Uh, I would have thought because you wait for FIFA for different things, and then players don't ever get a summer off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I saw a FIFA uh, FIFA Pro directive that they're going to try and 
put in a rule that if a player has played a certain number of games or minutes within the space of a week or two weeks, they, they're not allowed to play the next game. Um, I have no idea how they're going to try and put this rule in because clubs will say no. Uh, you, I don't think a club's going to go, oh, you're going to tell me the guy I pay, you know, 300 grand a week. I'm not allowed to pick him this week because you say he's played too many minutes. Um, it's for the players good and it would be lovely if they did it, but I don't think it will happen. I, I can't see it happening. The, the World Cup every two years, I just don't understand how they'd possibly do it because it's not just the uh, you've got the European Cup, you've got obviously Copper America, you've got the African Nations, it, there's uh, the you know the Asian Cup. Um, there's no way you can. How do you get all of those fixtures and games in? The f- footballers would literally have two weeks off an entire uh, entire year, and that would be it. There'd be so many injuries and, and problems. I can't, I really can't see it happening. Wouldn't it lose um, it as pale as well if we had one every summer, like a Euros a World Cup, a Euros a World Cup? But- you say that, but we 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 have, we have a Champions League every season, and that brings in lots of and that's, lots that's of money, boring. Lots of that's, why that's boring. That's why we're not in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a weird one. Um, I do, unless they can come to some sort of agreement with UEFA, then I don't see how it happened. And I think if it did start to happen, clubs would try and find ways to get players out of tournaments. Um, I think it's good on one part that it would give players who want to play at a World Cup a better chance because you might pick up an injury uh, if you're playing for, say, a smaller nation and they've qualified for this World Cup, but by the time you're fit again, the next World Cup, your country doesn't qualify. It's different if you're playing for Spain or Italy or someone like that. You're going to be there pretty much every year uh, or every competition. Um, So I think that's okay, but I can't, yeah, I I do not see that as a good idea at all. So I'm surprised Wenger's gone for that, to be honest, because I think if he was a club manager still, he wouldn't be saying that. Yeah, um, I, is, I agree. Is, I think, yeah, if he was still yeah. manager of Arsenal, I think he would have been dead set against it. Oh, yeah, no, I think he would be, you know, he'd, he'd try and ban all summer competitions if he could to keep his players fit, especially with the record he, that Arsenal had whilst he was there. Not, I'm not saying it's Arsenal's fault before he would jump on me for that because I know I'll get fucking stick for that as well. Um, right, okay, that's the interlo and the, and that done. Um, I saw, now this is a little post I saw on Twitter from... This is one listeners you can get involved with. I put this up on my Twitter um, and it was a retweet from Chris Wheatley, who I'm sure most Arsenal fans follow. Um, I think he writes for Football London, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, You've probably heard him on Ask Blog and other football podcasts and stuff. But if you don't follow him, it's uh, at Chris Wheatley underscore on Twitter. But yeah, if you go on my Twitter page, um, you'll see a little link. And there is uh, on their website, they've got a pick your results for the fixtures up till Christmas. Um, and see where the teams will be at that time. Um, Chris put his up, and he had Arsenal in fourth place with 41 points. Uh, yeah, Chelsea, Man City, Liverpool, then Arsenal. And then fifth place was Tottenham, 34 points, a whopping seven points behind, which is quite nice. So I thought for a bit of fun, I'd have a go. Um, I got Arsenal on fourth as well, but with a measly 36 points. And Brighton were in fifth, uh, not Spurs. Uh, and I had Chelsea, Liverpool, Man City as the top three. Um, I asked a few people, um, a couple of people from the group did it. Um, I'm just going to pull up Rich's here. Do, 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 do. Can't even remember what I put now. That's all right. So Rich had <laughs> Chelsea top. And remember, this is just to Christmas. This is not post-Christmas. This is up to the Christmas game. Um, and I'm going to ask Nick for his what he thinks the results will be. And I'll read the fixtures out so everyone's caught. Play along if you don't want to do it. Uh, Chelsea, Man City, Liverpool. Then he had Man United. Um, of all the tweets and replies I got, you were the only person who had Man United in the top four. Everyone else had them much lower. And then you had yeah, Arsenal like fifth. I said, I just, I just, I think they're they're going to cunt their, excuse my language, cunt their yeah. way to 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 get in points. Um, interestingly, though, you did have Arsenal on thirty four points, so you were only uh, two points less than what I predicted. Um, so, Nick, I'm going to go through this uh, with you now. I'm going to read out the fixtures, and all you've got to say is. Uh, win, loss, or draw. So okay. we'll go for the Premier League fixtures. Uh, Arsenal at home to Palace. Win. Oh, he's got a win. I think I put win for that as well. Uh, Arsenal mm. home to Villa. Another win. Oh, okay. Uh, away to Leicester. Win. Whoa, okay. Nick, what, it's, Nick, what a run. Well, this is a great, <laughs> this is a, what a way to come back from the international break. Three wins in advance. Um, at home to Watford. Win. 
Yep, I'm liking this. Okay, here comes the hard one. Away to Liverpool. Oh. <laughs> oh. Win. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I've oh. Yeah, go on, win. Screw it. Really? You're going to put no. win? Okay. No. <laughs> no? I, I, I don't want to say lose, but I don't want to say draw because that's just being safe, in it? Just on your honest opinion. I look, I put lose. I put I, I so did I. to win this game. Yeah, probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And just it was just more of a test to see roughly where everyone thought we were. Um home to Newcastle. Yeah, we'll beat them. Yeah, I had that as well. Away to Man United. Ooh, I I do actually fancy a draw for that one. I don't okay. know why. Draw. We always um, I think the first time we beat them for years last year at Oh, yeah, it was when like it, yeah. 13 years. It's the first It was time. a long, long I don't think we'll get two in a masterclass, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a part and part and El Nenny masterclass. It was. Mm. Um, right, a couple more fixtures till we get to Christmas. Away to Everton. Oh, we'll beat them. We'll beat I'll Everton. sack their okay. manager by then. Yeah. Uh, home to Southampton. Oh, dear. Southampton there, Christmas time. <laughs> I, know, I know where this goes. <laughs> All right, I'll go for a horrible draw. He's going for a draw. Okay. Home to West Ham. Oh, we'll beat them. Beat West Ham as well. Okay. <laughs> uh, away to Leeds. Ooh. Draw. Draw. Okay. So, Nick, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wins. So, what's that? That's 21 points. One loss, three draws. So, 24 points you've got out of those games. Um, I hope you followed along with that, listeners. I know this is very interesting content. Um, so... Nick, interestingly, you got Arsenal on 34 points as well. Exactly the same as Rich. Ooh. Now, obviously, when me and Rich did it, we used the link and you put in the predictions for all the other teams as well. But every single person I've seen reply on my tweet, um, it's not loads, to be fair, but other people in the group have messaged me back and stuff. We've, they've all got Arsenal on anywhere from 34. I think the lowest someone had was 31. Someone put, had us down on 31 points, yeah. Uh, so for one guy's on 31 everyone else has got us on 34 up to 37 points though on average now if you said before the season the general mood of Arsenal fans would be that positive I would have laughed in your face <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a proper Arteta apologist as well like big big time um, I just think it shows we're going in the right direction and that for the majority of those games that run up to Christmas um, I think we're playing, who is it, on Boxing Day? We've got, so we're away to Norwich on Boxing Day. Yes, which again, come on again, Aries. Um, <laughs> should, Me and Elsie will be, be there cheering on City, <laughs> sitting in the, in the City fans with our Arsenal yeah. shirts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of games, I'm not saying they're easy. Obviously, the Liverpool game's horrible, and I think Everton away is going to be tough as well because Benitez can get results if they haven't sacked him, which they shouldn't do, but, you know, stranger things happen. Um, I think it's a good run of fixtures that we can get some serious momentum in. Yeah, some of them we might get draws and not wins, and you know the Man United game is going to be tricky. Um, I still think they bought the wrong player. They shouldn't have bought Ronaldo. They should have got a midfielder. But um, which I also get laughed at by Man United fans. But there you go. Um, but I just I feel so much more confident this season, and I think it is a lot down to the new players that come in. Um, Ramsdale looks fantastic I mean in the Brighton game he made a ridiculous you know that sort of save and clawed it out Seaman-esque the way he really pushed that out and then it was cleared otherwise Mopay had a tap in um, he seems to command his box really well the back four look like they're gelling White and Gabriel look like they've got good understanding um, I do think Xhaka being injured is a big loss I know people don't like to admit that but I do think that is going to be a bit of an issue for us Um yeah, and I just I feel confident once the season starts up again. I think there is another international break in November, unfortunately, which is a bit annoying, breaks things up. But I don't know. I'm I'm looking forward to the season, what happens and what the young players can produce. You know, there's a lot more to come from Erdegaard, Saka, Smith Rowe. Um I do worry a little bit about Abamiang and Lacazette, what happens there. Um, but I'm I'm fairly confident that. Basically, up until the African nations, I'm going to look forward to watching Arsenal. When we get to the African Cup of Nations, I have no idea. <laughs> mm. how, how, how many games are they going to collectively miss? 
Uh, well, it will it will depend on obviously how long their countries are in the competition, but I'd imagine it's at least three weeks worth of games. Which if I go to January, have a couple of FA Cup games in there as well, won't we? Yeah, so there will be an FA Cup game. They're going to miss the away game to Tottenham, uh, home to Burnley, and hmm, possibly Man City. Um, on New Year's Day. Obviously, some of these games and the fixtures could be moved around depending on cup competitions and where mm. other teams are and stuff. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, I mean, there's two big games there that they would most likely will be missing uh, missing from, which is obviously... You're assuming problem. every one of our players is going to play in a team that goes to a final. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean... Theoretically, they, they could be back yeah. after three weeks, couldn't they? Oh yeah, of course. You know, um, I mean, if if they're there for the whole tournament, then they miss the whole month of January, pretty much. But Partey will be gone for at least two weeks. You would think Pepe will be gone for at least two weeks. Bamiang might be the first one back. Um, just I don't know as many good Gabonese players as there are. You know, um, is it Ivory Coast and who does Part? Where's Partey from? Is Ghana, isn't he? Yeah, Ghanaian. I don't know any uh, other. Got, yeah, um, Gavin plays. Yeah, I, I can't think of any others. There probably is some, and people are screaming into their headset or radio or whatever right now. Um, and obviously, El Nani as well. You know, Egypt always traditionally do quite well if they get fairly far into the competition, don't they, Rich? So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think they're going to have any of this self isolating for 10 days thing when they get back, or do you think that'll all be eased by then? That That is another problem as well that could crop up. You would hope that by that point, things would have calmed down. And because they're going to be playing, I guess, in, I don't know where exactly it is in Africa, but I'm guessing that they're going to be testing them all the time. And um, there might be some special dispensation for, I think there was one anyway for elite athletes where they can do like the test, like for two days or two or three days in a row. And as long as they come back negative for that, then they don't have to isolate afterwards. Um it, honestly, it's down to the UK government, obviously, what happens with that. Um, but yeah, just I'm sure, I'm sure some silver can uh... abandon it, couldn't they? Yeah, that's true. You know, just, just give Boris a call and a you know, 50 quid and a handshake, and I'm sure he'll sort you out and let you back in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, so it sort of brings me to the last point for the show. Um we didn't really get a ton of questions, but the ones we did are all sort of sent around. There's some stuff on Pepe, how we're going to do, and coming to that January window. Um, we've had a few links with players, and the two positions we've been linked with the most has been centre midfield and striker. Um, Lacazette's obviously out of contract in the summer, um, and Ketia as well. Both can sign pre-contract agreements come January um, with other clubs. I think with Enketia, we would get a conversation if he stays in the league or in England, at least. Um, Lacazette, obviously, we wouldn't. Um, so Would when we get... Compensation for him? Because didn't we have to pay some compensation to Chelsea when we got him? Um, yeah, but that was, I think, because of his age at the time and how long he's been at the club as a development player. And we would we'd get a certain amount. I mean, it's not huge amounts of money. It's it's probably just like a couple hundred grand or something stupid like that. Which I'd love a couple hundred grand. Yeah, I, I could take that quite happily if you don't want it, Arsenal. Um, well, yeah, it's the, not like we're, we're short of a penny. Like we did that thing with Derby the other day, didn't we? We postponed the um, yeah, the payment the payment yeah. for um, Bielik. Yeah, for Bielik. Yeah, which is I, which is yeah. I mean, it's nice, but also they haven't got any money to pay us anyway, so there's not much we could do, I guess. Um, but in terms of some of the names that we've been um, linked to, uh, striker-wise, we have been linked to, and I'm just going to bring it up because I've got it here. Right, so we've got three names. Uh, one that's just popped up, or that has been there before, uh, Alexander Isaac, um, who lots of people probably watched the Euros. Uh, but the two that have come up most prominently has been Ollie Watkins and Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Um not saying we're getting any of those free, uh, if we are getting anyone at all. But let's say it gets to January. Um, Abamyang's off, obviously, for African nations. Maybe Enketia does get sold or Lacazette does or something. They're going to have to bring someone in. Um, you know, Balogun and Martinelli are prospects, obviously. But you need someone probably in the 25 to 26 sort of range. 
someone who can step in when Aubameyang does, you know, uh, doesn't play as much in maybe a year, a year's time or something, and then gives a nice bridge for the younger guys to develop at, um, at an easier rate and not be thrown in. Um, out of those three, if you had to pick, which I'll come to you first, um, do any of them excite you? Uh, and if they do, which one would you take? Uh, the first one I don't know too too much about. Um, uh, if the top of my top of my brain, I think my brain's gone gone blank uh, for that blow. Is it Alexander Isaac? Is he the? Yeah. Is, is that Swedish? Oh my. He's uh Yes, yes, that is the one. I'm just bring, uh, bringing up his stats here. I'm sure it's Alexander. Someone's probably shouting. That's not his name. Uh, yeah, he's Alexander Isaac. I knew I knew something about football. Yeah, he's uh, he is 22. Um, he's currently at uh, Sociedad is where he signed for. He was at Dortmund previously. Um, okay. Played in their in their like B team, and then I think he went out on loan whilst at Dortmund to someone else in Germany, possibly. Oh no, he oh. went to the Dutch league. That was it. Yeah. Okay. I'm well, I'm I'm, I'm going to disregard him for for until I see a bit more mm. more of him and do. You know the, the the fabled my own research. You know YouTube. The, the YouTube study. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for, uh, thing I think from from memory in the Euros, I think he was quite impressive. But mm. I haven't heard hide nor hair of him um, since then. But then you know I I, I don't watch other leagues as uh, all that yeah. much. Uh, uh, out of DLC and Ollie Watkins, um, I think I had a rumor that both of them are gooners, uh, mm. especially Watkins. Um, I'm I'm a fan of both of them. To be fair. Um, my initial reaction would be to go for DLC just because I think with his height and physicality, he gives us a plan B. He gives us something different. Um, you know, he gives us that hold up play. He gives us, you know, that aerial threat for, for Tierney's constant crosses. Um, so that would be my, um, that would be my, uh, my preference, you know, I I, th- I think Watkins and and Abamyang's slightly tra- skills are slightly transferable, mm-hmm. you know, uh, quicker guys and, and and stuff like that. Whereas, let's say uh, Calvert Lewin, he has that 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 height, that physicality, that ability to hold up the ball, to bring up um, bring others into play, and, and make the ball the ball stick to him a little bit more. So he he would be my choice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nick, do you have any preference on the three, or is there someone else that you would be more interested in? That's sort of in the similar price range, I guess, to those guys. Well, it depends on the price. I mean, obviously, I'd like Calvert Lewin because similar to what Rich said, you know, he's something different. Mm-hmm. He's not not at all like Lacazette or Aubameyang. You know, I would definitely go, but that depends. I mean, if Lacazette, if someone actually comes in and offers us money for Lacazette. And that's you know something like 15 20 million. We've got to take it. That's just yeah. we might as well and put that money towards you know if we could get like Cal. I mean, I'm not sure how much they paid for him or you know. I mean, you're probably talking. Didn't about he come up through the, through their academy, Calvert Lewin? I think he might have come up through their academy. Again, we do the Google search whilst being very professional. Um, he did. Ah, oh, he was at Sheffield United. And then they bought him in 2016 for 1.5 million. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I'll offer them um, three and they'll have doubled their money. That's how this works. <laughs> right? I think that's how it works. Sim- simple maths, yeah. Makes sense to <laughs> well, me. Well, I'm related to Dick Law, obviously. <laughs> that's why nothing ever get done. But yeah, I mean, but if we could get, if I don't think it matters if Enketia goes because I don't think we're ever going to get that much money for him anyway. Balogun doesn't really play, but if Lacazette, if someone offers us money for Lacazette in January, like even 15, just put that money, just go get him because yeah. we might as well, we might as well replace Lacazette in January as to wait until the summer. And if we can get him in, I mean, I don't know what his contract situation is. I mean, he's been there well, since 2016, so he's been there five, nearly six years. So we would want to go, and I don't know who else are gonna buy him. So yeah, thirty-five to forty maximum in January. I'd do that if Lacazette go. Yeah, uh, let's just have a look. He's John. Yes, well, your your thing. Who's that? You watch Italian football? Who I do is watch the, Italian um, football. Is there is there a, a Serbian guy who plays for? Is it Fiorentina? Yes, Vlahovic. 
Um, that's, that's he's sod. Uh, 21, I think. 21, 22. His agent in the summer was um, going around most of Europe uh, sort of saying, come and buy my player. Um because there was a lot of hype around him. He's not had the best starts of the season. Um, mm. He scored goals, but a lot of them have been penalties. There is there is a thing with getting players from Italy, uh, in particular strikers. Um, when Belotti burst onto the scene for Torino, um, and he had a really good season, scored loads of goals, and just looked amazing. You're just like, wow, this is like watching Luca Toni with pace. This is unbelievable. Mm. Um, and there was talks of like 50 million, and this is a few years ago now, um, he, him going for it. He didn't go. And I thought, okay, well, he's going to say it's Torino. We'll do another really good season. Then maybe he'll go to Ju- Juve or Inter or someone like that. Since that first amazing season, he hasn't really done it again. And that is why I would be, lots of people have asked me about Vlahovic. I'm not saying he's not a good player because he is still very young, but, I would wait until you see how he does for the rest of the season with Fiorentina. Fiorentina are playing the best football at the moment. Um, so it's not all on him, but he's not playing particularly great himself. So until you see someone do it consistently for more than one season in Syria, in particular strikers, I'm very reticent to say, yeah, go and get them. Um, just because you can have, I mean, it's the same in any league. You can have a really good season and then disappear. Um, oh God, who's the guy at Swansea? Michu. At Swansea, mm. he was like the best striker in the world, wasn't he? For or in Europe at least for you know six months and then just completely disappeared. And now I don't even know if he's still what playing. The other guy at Swansea, so oh, um, G- Gomez, he, he he had a really good about yeah. year and a half, and then he completely I don't know, where yeah, he went. yeah. That you do get players that do this, they have a great you know season or something and then just just fall off. So, um, from a high hitch, he might be a good player, uh, and he might go on to be a really good player, but. I'm not convinced currently. Um, out of the two, I'm just pulling up their um, contracts at the moment. So, Calvert Lewin, he is contracting until 2025, and obviously he's English. So that immediately means you've got to stick 10 million on whatever the price is, just because he's mm. English. But you haven't um, got to worry about him adapting to the league, have you? No, you haven't. And he's 24, so sort of correct age range maybe we'd want someone a little bit older um but he certainly fills the profile um as for ollie watkins i'll bring up watkins now uh if this thing works ollie watkins he is he's a year older he's 25 his contract is also to 2025 um but i think see he's valued at like 12 million less again this is all according to transfer market Mm -hmm. I do get what you're saying in terms of hold-up like 30-odd million or something, wouldn't they? Um, yeah, 30-odd million. They got him for... Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, 30 million. So, I mean, I'd imagine they'd at least want that money back, um, you would think. But yeah, he's... 50 million back for Lacazette, but we're not going to get it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, the one thing I would say between the two um, that... I think if any move does happen for either of them, and maybe it isn't January, maybe it's not something that happens till the summer, I think Watkins fits Arteta's plan more just because his pressing from the front is much better than Calvert Lewin's. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the was it last season you saw the way he sort of bullied our defenders um, when because Villa did. I think they did the double over us last season, didn't they? Mm-hmm. And he was um, he was really really good in those in both those games, but. Yeah, I, I think he fits, for me, fits the bill more. Alexander Isaac is the more exciting sort of exotic name, um, one that uh, Chris always talks about. I think he might be, at the moment, maybe a little bit too weak for this league, uh, physically. He's very tall and he's got great dribbling and his hold-up play is actually quite good. Um, but he would probably need to bulk up a bit when he, when he if he came to the Premier League. He, he might be, weirdly, the cheaper option, though, even though he's more of the certainly around Europe anyway, more of the name player. Um, just quickly onto the centre mid one, obviously because of the fact that, you know, Xhaka isn't going to be back until probably January. And even then it's going to take him a couple of games to get fit. Partey as well will be gone. El Nenny will be gone. That basically leaves us with Lokonga, Xhaka just coming back from injury and Maitland-Niles. Isn't that, Lokonga that's... going to the African Cup of Nations, <clears throat> Mike? Oh dear. He's Belgian. <laughs> Obviously, um, I think he was actually born there, wasn't he? Lokonga, 
I'm sure he was born there. Um, I'm going to look that up now, so I don't look like a complete idiot. Was he born in Belgium? Yes, he was born in Brussels. There you go. Um, terrible, terrible, Nick. So we are short again in centre mid come January. And it's still, I think, a position that we do need someone in. I think what you saw in the Brighton game is that, again, people don't like Jacka, but his incisiveness with his passing, I think he's in the top three for the season of midfielders in the whole of Premier League for most passes into the final third. He might be actually number two on the list. Again, another one of those stats versus eye test thing because everyone always, the only passes you remember Xhaka making is where he passes it back to a centre-back. Never the ones he does forwards. Um, but we do need, definitely need someone at centre-mid um, and it's just whether that happens in January. But yeah, that's basically it for this week because we haven't really got a lot else to talk about Arsenal-wise, have we? Um, the Arsenal ladies are really good to watch, although they did lose to Barcelona. But it was a very good game. Very, though. very good Barcelona side. Yeah, but nice. obscenely good, I think, that could beat quite a lot of men's teams, mm. to be fair. Um, but yeah, if you aren't watching the Arsenal ladies, uh, definitely check them out. Also, all the Women's Champions League, um, I think nearly every game is currently being shown on YouTube, um, at least the group games mm. um, and the qualifiers and stuff. And you can pick uh, the language for your commentary as well. I don't know how, I don't know, obviously, they didn't have every single language, but. Uh, if you're not a native English speaker, there's probably a language on there that maybe you understand better than English. Us ignorant English people can just about speak English and don't understand any other languages. Um, so it's, 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 I can say a few swear words in Arabic. And <laughs> this week I've been learning for the last 30 days, I've been learning Spanish on Duolingo. Oh, OK. Well, there you go. go there's something me. else. Yeah, something else you can do on your interlow break if you've got nothing else to entertain yourself with. But yeah, that is it for this week. Um if you enjoyed the show, give us a thumbs up, leave us a review on iTunes, comment, whatever. Um, I don't know if we're doing another one next week or not. Um, I will speak to Danny and he'll put something up on the Twitter page and on Facebook. Um, if you haven't checked it out after you've listened, go have a look at that thing. I'll post it. I'll pin it as my top tweet, uh, the Premier League predictor thing up till Christmas. Um, go and have a go on that and just reply, take a little screenshot, reply with um, what you've got. It's just a good way to sort of gauge the mood of other Arsenal fans and where everyone thinks we are at the moment. Um, yeah. And, you know, it wasn't a great day down on the South Coast, but it could have been worse. You could have been our Simon sat there in a press box with a bit of plastic over your laptop, hoping it didn't break because it was raining so much, <laughs> getting absolutely <laughs> soaked. Um, so, yeah, that just leaves me to say thank you to my guests for coming on. So, Rich, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Well, pleasure as always, mate. And Nick, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. And just a quick reminder as well, a little plug for Nick. Um, if people do want to watch you on Twitch, where should they go? Uh, go to Twitch. That's, uh, just search in there, Nick Fights. If you want to come and troll me for playing games badly, or at the moment I'll be playing like scary games for Halloween. So if you want to watch a bloke from Norwich scream his head off playing scary games, that's the way to go. Halloween games are always good to watch. <laughs> how, how, how scary are we talking? Are we are we talking? Was it was it Project Fear? That game was brilliant back in the day. Did well, anyone, I jumped. I was, play I was playing um, Luigi's Mansion the other day, and that made me jump. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to play an action scary game. Well, there you go. If you want to laugh at a grown man jumping at a child's game, then go and check out Nick uh, Nick fights on Twitch. But yeah, that's it for us for this week. Um, as I say, Danny will post something about whether we're doing another pod next week or not. I'm sure we'll come up with something to try and entertain you. Maybe. Chris will do one of these cool uh, ABW uh, talks to someone vaguely interesting that's not us. Um, but yeah, that's it for us this week. So thank you for watching. Good night all and up the Arsenal. Bye-bye. Adios.